Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody back, and uh, I trust you've all had your coffee, and uh, I notice there's a lot of goodies over there again today, aren't there? Now, goodness sakes, I hope you all realize Iris doesn't do it alone anymore. We've got a lot of help for this crowd, but way back in our beginning days, yeah, she used to bring in the refreshments and everything, but uh, again, we just have to thank everybody for helping out. Anyhow, for those of you out in television, if you're ever coming through Tulsa on a first Wednesday of the month, check with us first, of course, but... Uh, Come in and be a part of this taping afternoon. We just have a good time. And again, uh, in case we have new listeners, listeners, we like you to know that we're totally independent. We're not uh, beholden to any denomination or organization. We just simply want to teach the Word. And uh, we're not concerned about where it falls or who it approaches. But uh, we'll get you into the book. That's the name of the game. Uh, we're in book 66, it's on the board, and uh, if you are interested in this particular series of programs, just call the office and uh, put your order in for book number 66. But it won't be ready for a while yet, will it? We need one more taping. Okay, let's go back to this concept of what we have just been talking about for the last two programs, that when Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, he had no concept yet of a crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection, or going to the Gentile world unless it could be through the king and the earthly kingdom when every Jew would become, of course, a priest of Jehovah and would there in turn to the Gentile world. But that is completely out of their thinking. Everything is still Jewish. It's still connected to the promises made to the fathers. And now we're going to jump on up past his crucifixion and his resurrection, and we're going to come in at Acts. After the fact, he has now just spent 40 days with the 11. And uh, we always tell people, if you want to get a glimpse of our resurrection existence, you go and read the account of his 40 days after resurrection, and you'll get a pretty good picture of what kind of a body we'll have. And Paul confirms it in Philippians when he says what? And we'll have a body fashioned after his glorious body. But all right, Acts chapter 1, and let's just start down at verse 3, and we're going to continue on this premise that Peter had an understanding now that he was the fulfillment of all of these Old Testament promises, promises concerning Israel. All right, now in Acts chapter 1 then, verse 3, it's at the end of his 40 days after his resurrection, and now verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive, that is, the eleven apostles, <clears throat> he showed himself alive after his passion, that is, his death and burial and resurrection, and he showed it by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. And in those forty days they're speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Well, that's like we've got it on the board. The overall influence of God's righteous rule and control of the universe and of the heavenlies, the angelic hosts, the Old Testament believers, you and I now who are in the kingdom by virtue of being in the body of Christ. But the body of Christ is still unknown here, so all they could talk about was the kingdom of God in generalities and this coming kingdom of heaven on the earth as we see in the left-hand circle. All right, that's what they talked about for 40 days. They didn't talk about the body of Christ or going to the Gentiles. That, that's still an unknown factor. All right, now then get to verse 6. If you don't think these men were human and mortal and just as ordinary in their ambitions, then you better read verse 6. And when they therefore were come together, they asked him, the Lord Jesus, now in his resurrected body, remember, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? I think they had an understanding now that Christ had to die. He had to be the atoning blood. He had to be the sacrifice for sin so far as Israel was concerned, but to understand that it was for the whole world, no, I don't think they had that yet. Everything in their thinking concerns 
their own nation of Israel. Are you ready now to bring in this promised kingdom that we've been talking about for the last two or three programs? And now look at the Lord's answer. He doesn't ridicule them. But he says, it's not for you to know the time or the season. It's not for you to know when. That's in the power of the Father. All right, but just to get an inkling of why these men were so anxious to get an affirmative answer that the kingdom was about to come in, go back with me to Matthew chapter 19. And I know we've done this way, way back, and uh, some of this is repetition, but you've got to realize that's the way we learn over and over and over again. Matthew 19. We'll drop into verse 27, honey. Matthew 19, verse 27. Now this, of course, is back again before the crucifixion, back in his earthly ministry. All got it? Matthew 19, verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we are forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Now see, he's not talking about salvation. He's got that. That was confirmed already back in the first half hour that we looked at when Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but the Father which is in heaven. So Peter and we trust the other ten had that salvation because they believed without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was the Messiah. And that was the crux of this kingdom gospel. All right, so what are we going to get for reward? We know we're saved. We know we're going to have eternal life. But what else are we going to get? And the Lord again doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't ridicule him. But he tells him what it's going to be. Next verse. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that you who have followed me, you eleven men, the twelfth one is going to come in in a little bit in the book of Acts, but you who have followed me in the regeneration, in other words, when this old earth is made back as it was in the beginning, beautiful, without the curse, without sin, without death, it's going to be as it was in the Garden of Eden, and it's going to be the whole planet regenerated. All right? In that regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, that throne we've been talking about for the last two half-hour program, on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, when He's going to be the Messiah, the King of Israel, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and He's going to sit upon His own throne, now, you know, there is a move afoot amongst some of our great theologians to proclaim that Christ is now ruling from his throne in heaven. What a lie. That's not according to the book. He's at the Father's right hand. Don't you believe it when you read it, that he's sitting on the throne and ruling from heaven? No, he's not. He's at the Father's right hand, interceding for us. And it's not until he returns and sets up this kingdom that he assumes a throne and a kingship. And that's what it says right here. Oh, let's see. Is there another one? Keep your hand in 19. I'm not through here. Go ahead a few pages to chapter 25. Yeah, and we'll just jump in at verse 31. Because it's so obvious the scripture does not put Christ on a throne until he returns and sets up this kingdom with the capital in Jerusalem. Now this is just for comparison's sake. Matthew 25, verse 31. All got it? When the Son of Man shall come in His glory at His second coming, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. He doesn't leave his throne in heaven to sit on his throne in Jerusalem. He's not on the throne today or tonight. He's at the Father's right hand. But he will be when he returns. All right, now then, just for sake of time, drop down to verse 34. Then shall the what? The king. Now he's the king. See, much of Christianity has got it all upside down. He's not the king of the church. 
No way, shape, or form is he the king of the church. He won't be the king until he returns and sets up his kingdom. He's the head of the body. He's not the head of the king of the church, but here he will be. Then shall the king say, see? And he sits upon his throne in Jerusalem. All right, back to chapter 19. Verse 28 again. You who have followed me in the regeneration, in other words, where the world has been made fit for the kingdom economy, it's going to be glorious, it's going to be beautiful, it's going to be without the curse, no sin, no death, no thorns, no thistles. The wild animals will become what we would call domesticated. They will no longer be carnivorous. They're all going to eat what grows naturally. It's going to be glorious. And yet there's going to be people on earth enjoying it, of course. All right, so the nation of Israel is going to be under Christ's immediate domain. Now read on. That you have followed me in the generation when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. See, that's a future verb here. When the Son of Man shall. That's a future verb. Not present or past. But when he shall sit in the throne of his glory. Oh, here's what Peter was waiting for. You also, you twelve apostles, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging or ruling. Now remember I always use the term judging in this scenario as a benevolent government. Now when you see the word and he will judge the nations in the Old Testament, for example, it's a benevolent rule. doesn't mean punishing. It's a benevolent rule. All right, same way here. Peter and the eleven aren't going to be chastising the twelve tribes of Israel. They're going to be giving a benevolent government, a benevolent rule. Everything that they do and decree will be for the blessings of their people. All right, and you'll sit upon the twelve thrones judging or ruling the twelve tribes of Israel. Not the whole world. Israel. And so that will be their domain. All right, now then let's flip back to Acts chapter 1 again. And since there's going to be 12 thrones and there's only 11 apostles, Peter's all shook up. So what's the first thing on what they call today the agenda? What's number one? Fill the shoes of Judas. Because the Lord's going to be coming back in short order and we have to be ready. So what does he do? He says, we must. Now let's go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 15. Now this is all in view of this coming kingdom that Peter puts in Matthew 16. Acts chapter 1, verse 15. And so in those days, right after Christ has just ascended back here in verse 9 and 10, and so they're on their own. The Lord is gone. Holy Spirit hasn't come yet. Verse 15, and so in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, that is the Jewish believers, who were small in number, remember, out of the whole nation of Israel. And so he stood up in the midst of the disciples and he said, there were about 120, men and brethren, this scripture must needs be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, who was guide to them that took Jesus, Verse 17, for he, Judas, was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. He was one of the twelve. Now verse 18, Peter is telling what happened. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. His sin caught up with him. And falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and his bowels gushed out. In other words, that's when he fell on his own sword. Verse 19, and it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem insomuch that the field is called in the proper tongue Alkadama, that is to say, the field of blood. All right, now here comes Peter's big hurry to fill the slot. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric, or his place of authority in the twelve, let another take. So there's Peter's permission now to get with it and fill the slot left empty by Judas's uh, act of rejection and rebellion and betrayal and what have you. Now then, verse 21, Peter says, Wherefore, of these men, out of the 120 total men and women, we don't know how many men there were, 
Wherefore are these men who have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us? Now here are the requirements for this candidate that they're going to vote on to fill Judas's place. That this man has to be from the beginning with the baptism of John unto the same day that he, Jesus, was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Now remember I pointed out several programs back. There are good men, and one especially that I regard so highly. He's long gone, and yet he adamantly held to the fact that Peter was remiss by not waiting for Paul, who should have been the twelfth apostle. How in the world could anybody think such a thing? In the first place, Paul isn't going to be converted until another ten years later. And he was not a follower from the baptism of John until the resurrection. Far from it, he was the biggest rejecter of Christ in Israel. But yet, see, that's how they can, can twist the scriptures, that Peter should have waited for Saul of Tarsus. No, it would have never worked because Paul did not qualify in this way. And then you know what happened. They ended up with two men, and out of the two, Matthias was the one that was chosen. All right, now as we go into chapter 2, we're still going to continue this concept that Peter had a good understanding of this coming earthly kingdom over which the Messiah would rule and reign. And that's why his confession of faith emphasized, Thou art the Christ. The Son of the living God. He doesn't say a word about his cross. He doesn't say a word about resurrection, shed blood. All he says is that he is the promised Messiah of Israel. All right, now let's pick this up in chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the Pentecostal sermon as we call it, and look how Peter approaches it. Now remember, he's got Jews in his audience from every nation under heaven. They've been scattered as a result of the Babylonian captivity 600 years before. And so Jews are now congregating in every nation in the then known world. But they come back to Jerusalem for the feast days. I think it was almost a requirement that they make two of them out of the, how many are there, seven? But anyway, every feast day there would be multitudes of Jews from every nation out there in the then known world. And you know the account on the day of Pentecost, how they all were hearing the twelve speak in their native tongue, whether they were from Babylon or Syria or Africa or Rome or whatever, they heard those men in their own language. All right, now then, let's move on to verse 22. Verse 22, and watch the language. This is all I implore people. Don't go by what I say. Don't go by what any preacher says. You go by what the book says. And then you'll be on pretty solid ground. And here Peter does not include a single Gentile. He says, you men of Israel. That's who he's talking to. He's talking to his fellow Jews. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by, here it comes now, miracles and wonders and signs. And remember I told you in the first half hour, what was the purpose of all that? To prove who he was. And Peter is appealing on the same basis. Remember, all of the miracles that he performed for three years, he was the Messiah. And now he's going to say that he still is the Messiah because God raised him from the dead. That's the whole purpose of it. All right, here we go. Verse 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. What does that tell you? Way back in eternity past, God laid the blueprint for everything concerning creation, for everything concerning the human race, knowing that they would fall into sin, knowing that they would need a Redeemer, and the only way that God could redeem the human race was to take on flesh by one of the members of the Godhead, God the Son, and he would have to go the way of a Roman crucifixion. It was all in the blueprint. That's why everything happened according to his timetable. 
<clears throat> nothing was by accident. Well, it's the same way today. You know, uh, as, as horrible as things are getting in the world, I'm getting less and less exercised by it because these things have to happen. Nothing is going to stop it. The Democrats won't stop it. The Republicans won't stop it. The United Nations won't stop it. The European community won't stop it. It's going to keep moving on God's timetable. Nothing is going to change it. Everything has to come according to this book. And the world can't see it. They don't want to see it. But we can. All right, it's the same way with the crucifixion. It was all in God's timetable. It was preordained before the world was ever created. And that's what Peter is reminding Israel, see? All right, verse 23. Him, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, see? You have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain for the sins of the world? No, that's not what Peter says. He doesn't mention that. All he says now is in verse 24 that even though you killed him, God raised him up. And like I said in the last program, could a dead Messiah become a king? Well, of course not. But if he'd been raised from the dead, he could. And so here's the whole idea. The resurrection was when God raised him from the dead, called him back to glory with the promise that he would now return and yet bring in the kingdom. See? All right, now I skipped over that, and I probably shouldn't have. I think we got time. Let's just stop here for a moment, and let's just back up. That's the way I teach, and people are getting used to it. So I don't apologize for this. Let's back up to Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1. Just jump in at verse 8. It's in red, so the Lord is speaking it. And this is just before he makes his ascension. But he tells the eleven, You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It's a reference to the day of Pentecost. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, of course, we know from reality that it stopped at Samaria. They never did get to the uttermost parts of the earth. Never. That was going to be left for the next apostle. But now verse 9. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they, the eleven, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by him in white apparel, but they're angels. Verse 10, or verse 11, And these angels said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. Well, now again, we always like to tie this into the Old Testament, come back to Zechariah, and you have the perfect picture that is given here in Acts. Zechariah 14. We were there earlier today. Zechariah 14. Verse 4, Zechariah 14, verse 4, almost identical language. And now Zechariah is written 400 and some years before Christ. That's the beauty of prophecy. That's the proof that this is the Word of God. No other book on earth can do this. No other book. I don't care which one they want to talk about. There is no other book on earth that can give you prophecy like this. So 400 and some years before it happened... His death, burial, and resurrection, and Peter announcing that, or that the Lord is told, the angels, I'm sorry, the angels announcing that he's going to come again. Here it is in the Old Testament, verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave or separate in the midst thereof, and so on and so forth. All right, what does Acts say? 
They're on the Mount of Olives when he ascends. And this same Jesus in like manner will come again to the same Mount of Olives, according to prophecy. See? All right. Now then, coming back to chapter 2, with this full understanding now by Peter in the 11, that the one who was crucified has ascended back to the Father's right hand, but he's going to come again. But now here's the kicker. Did they have any idea it would be 2,000 years? No, they thought it would be <laughs> shortly after the seven years of tribulation would come in and Christ would return. In their lifetime, I maintain that up until the end of their writings, all these men had the, the inclination to believe that Christ would be returning in their lifetime. Now, you know, it's interesting that it isn't until you get to Second Peter that he now, in so many words, directs his Jewish readers to not go to Christ's earthly ministry. He doesn't say, go read John, like most people say today. Peter tells his readers to read who? Paul. Peter says, you go to Paul's epistles, and you understand the wisdom that was given unto him. Well, it just struck me not too long ago. Why did that wait until the end of Peter's life or the end of Paul's life, which is about 68 or 69 A.D.? Because what's going to happen in about next year? The temple is going to disappear. The temple is going to be destroyed by the Roman forces. Now, you take the temple out of Judaism, and what have you got? A hollow shell. And so now it was appropriate for those Jewish to believers to forget about temple worship, forget about the whole legal system of the Mosaic law. Now you come into Paul's gospel of grace, because that's where it's all at. It's good food for thought, isn't it? Everything is in God's divine timing. That was never mooted until it was just about time for the temple to be removed from all of Israel's day-to-day -day lifestyle because they're no longer under the law. If they're going to become a believer, they have to come under grace. Now, of course, they're waiting for the day when they can get their temple again, and they will. It's going to be one of the uh, tenets of that uh, treaty made between Antichrist and the then known world, and they're going to have permission to rebuild their temple. But until then, a Jew has to come in to Paul's doctrines of grace, and that's why Peter made it so plain. You go to Paul's epistles. Okay, we'll pick it up in the next program. <clears throat>